Welcome to the Winged Wheel Podcast. Here to talk all things hockey are your hosts, Brad Crisco, Ryan Hanna, and Evan Lobsinger. Imagine being swept in a season series by the 2019-20 Detroit Red Wings. Four times in a row you lose to the Detroit Red Wings. How embarrassing. All that talk of Montreal maybe slipping into the playoffs was just talk, and all that effort was all for nothing. The <laughs> the Montreal Canadiens are going to finish eight points out of a playoff spot. <laughs> And it's going to be so funny when it happens. They couldn't take... Did any of the games go into overtime at all? Was it four regulation losses? I uh, I would actually have to look into it, but I, I want to say... I think it was four regulation losses. I'll look that up. <laughs> and it, the last one... It wasn't even like they lost the last one to the Red Wings, which would be bad enough. They were up 3-1 in the third period. Yeah, how do you let that happen? That is... A fireable offense for every player and member of that organization. The coach is gone. The assistant coaches are gone. The general manager is gone. The owner has to sell the team. Four regulation losses. Oh, oh my God. This is all because of the uh, goading and humming and hawing after Kotkaniemi stayed with the Habs last year and Zadina was down in the AHL, obviously. Because there's no, like, bad blood right now between Red Wings fans and Habs fans. Like, they don't care. You clearly weren't in my mentions over the last couple days. Uh, no, because you had the successful troll post. Yeah. Uh, I, there's an there's an 18.5% chance that's going to happen. Hmm. Someone commented on it to make it better, too. So the Detroit Red Wings sweep the Montreal Canadiens, causing the fan base to absolutely implode. The Red Wings still finish last, therefore maintaining the highest percentage uh, odds in the draft lottery. The Red Wings then use that highest odds to win the draft lottery. Then they draft French Canadian superstar Alexi Lafreniere first overall. Where's the draft, by the way? In Montreal. If they don't get Zadina to announce that pick, this is all for nothing. <laughs> this is all for nothing? For nothing. If Zadina announces that pick, oh my God, I cannot even imagine. I want Zadina and Mantha on stage. The French Canadian superstar, yeah, and the not Yesperi Cot Kanyemi star <laughs> to draft Alexi Lafreniere. I, I've never needed anything more in my life than I need this. Like even the Bru, even the lowly Boston Bruins found a way to beat the Red Wings. Like even they won their own personal Stanley Cup and beat Detroit. And Montreal couldn't beat them once. That was more than twenty five percent of Detroit's wins because they have what like fifteen on the year. They have 15, come, yeah. Have come against the Habs. That's, oh. A te this team loses. This team has a negative 100 and what, 5, 104 goal differential? And you lost them four straight times? In regulation. In regulation? No other team has worse than a minus 50 goal differential. <laughs> oh, my God. Like, I don't even feel like we need to be attacking Habs fans in general. But for that, for this to happen, it's like, I'm sorry, you do not escape the cold, ruthless grasps of the Internet. This is really you're going to be ridiculed forever. Almost everybody listening to this is a Red Wings fan. And they know as well as we do that this year as a fan has been torture, because for the first few months of the season, we were getting just ridiculed by everybody mercilessly and we just have to take it because we don't have a comeback we didn't have the upper hand on anybody we were historic and are historically bad now it's so bad that people don't even i've noticed my mentions and friends and people i mean public they're not even mean towards writing it's just like who do you cheer for oh, i'm a and they're just like oh bless your heart well the the historically bad because colorado avalanche like what was their however many points they had that one year 48 48 they never swept anyone in a season series ah. so that's a big one for detroit but that's what this is why we've dealt with crap for a whole year without being able to trash talk anybody else with any sort of validity this is the one sorry montreal it's you and we're riding this until at least october welcome to the winged wheel podcast i'm ryan Hanna. i'm brad crisco and i'm evan hey evan what's up i bet they thought you weren't here probably for the there's like 500 or so who are watching on YouTube who knew they probably saw you just they knew right away yeah uh, well I mean you sit very still you're like uh, Drax 
You sit. You stand so. Well, I'm not allowed to move. Why not? Well, I make too much noise. You do make so much noise. I've never heard such a constant stream of like dad noises. It just general. I don't know what noises come out of Everything you. always hurts for some reason. You're like white noise. He's just like a white noise machine. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Evan is here, and this is our trade deadline preview episode of the Winged Wheel podcast. So I am hoping beyond hope that um, all of the trades that are going to happen now wait until Monday so that this episode isn't instantly ruined uh, by a mega trade. Um, Everything could be ruined by a mega trade for me, at least. How come? Uh, because my I'm taking my family to the game Sunday night against Calgary the evening before the trade deadline. And mine, but more specifically, my daughter's favorite Red Wing is number one, the, the highest Red Wing on the trade board right now. So we're really hoping she gets to watch him, which right now isn't looking likely. As of right now, the most recent trade that happened was uh, Danik Martell for Anthony Greco between Florida and Tampa Bay. Just to give you a little bit of big a, needle mover. Uh, I'm giving them like a bench, like a timeline thing here. It's not, it's no Philip Baroni and Riley Barber for Joseph Blandizi and Jacob Lucchini. Is that just purely between Philadelphia and New York born players? Like, this is such Italian names. Anyways, that's that's the most recent trade. We just got word that uh, Mesnikov is sitting for Ottawa. He's not dressing tonight. So um, that's kind of where we're at in the world. So if anything else drops, know that it came after we recorded this on Thursday uh, early evening. Um, okay, let's talk a little bit about the Red Wings first and what they have moving forward in terms of games and stuff, and then we'll move right into trades. Please don't trade Athena see you till Monday if you're going to do it. It's all I ask. So we have uh, our trade deadline coverage means Thursday episode uh, to try and stay as up to date as possible. And we won't be recording until after the trade deadline on Monday. So trade deadlines at 3 p.m. Eastern and we're going to be recording later that day uh, and have the episode episode dropping for you Monday night. So between now and then the Red Wings are going to play uh, in Long Island against the Islanders and then at home against Calgary, as Brad mentioned on Sunday before we talk again. Um, yeah, the game against Montreal, third period comeback, Athanasiu two goals, which was huge. It's crazy how he has, what, five goals in his last six games now? Mm -hmm. It's almost like the first half of his season was an aberration of un just being unlucky in a career-low shooting percentage, and he's still really good at hockey. Yeah, the guy's crazy talented, has 10 goals in how many games has he played? Like, I don't know. Um He's got something. more goals in the last week, it feels like, than he had the rest of the season, which might actually be statistically true or close. Um, and you know what? He's like he has looked a lot better. Uh, Forty-five games—that's what it is. So he he has looked a lot better. You see a little bit more of that flash of talent. Again, this whole team is depleted. Nobody has a good line right now. Like pretty much the only people benefiting consistently are the people playing with Larkin. That's it. Um, every anyone else is liable to be struggling because they're stuck on a line like a third line or a fourth line or something. Um, but no, Athens CU with two goals last night or not last night. Um, the other night was pretty big in that comeback win. Who else scored? Who was it? Fabry and Mike Green. Yes, Mike Green whiffed on the shot and it still went in. <laughs> a little Ephus pitch. Yeah, a little uh, ten million dollar goaltender letting in. Uh, is that how you pronounce it, Ephus? Yeah, I love those. Those are so funny. Those are the best. They almost never happen. I think they're that's that's, a, that's a, a big dick play. Yeah, that is that's a big brass one. Um, two of them, five uh, hundredth point for him and hundred fiftieth goal, and then uh, Robbie Fabry obviously with a great goal. He's the one who put the Red Wings on the board first. I love Fabry, man. He's like such a consistent good spot for this team. Great trade. Who's yeah. at the door? Who's that? Someone is at. Oh, I think it's uh, a package. It's actually uh, more envelopes for us. Believe oh, it or not, cool. we had to order envelopes because There's some sort of irony in getting envelopes mailed to you. Yeah, there is, isn't it? Yeah. Well, I wasn't going to go to Staples and see people. <laughs> I'm not risking my life out in society. So you want me to do a thing between work and home? Yeah, that's not happening. If it's not the grocery store, it's not happening. You know what the biggest scam is? When you're growing up, they teach you how to fill your day with things like, you know, so you're ready to be an adult and then. You have all these things when like you're a teenager and a young adult. And then when you become an adult, all those things get scaled up and your schedule is just full. And yes. they never give you more hours. That's why people drink. You never get more hours in the day. It's true. 
Is there like at any point do you like level up and they're like, hey, you unlocked like an extra two hours a day? I just cut a lot of things out. That's really what it comes down to. Prior prioritization. Yeah, key. yeah, they're like normal stuff like golf. You don't cut golf out. No, golf is at the top. Yeah, you prioritize golf. Winter sports. Yeah, the podcast's like fourth or fifth. Oh, at the absolute most. Yeah, where's cat? I don't know. We we intersect between jobs mm. being at the same house, so I, it's kind of like just happens. So can't really put that on the list. How romantic. Yep. They say romance is dead in the tw- in the in 2020. It is not. What did you guys do for Valentine's Day? Uh, we went snowboarding. I took. We both took the day off work and went snowboarding. Yep. That's their version. That's the most white person thing ever. <laughs> I was like, is, I'm sorry. That is the whitest Valentine's Day yeah. I've ever heard of. Father of two, what do you do for Valentine's Day? I hate you both so much. <laughs> oh, we don't have enough time in a day, you know, with our... What do you do with your lives? I have three things that I do in my life. This podcast, work, and deal with children. There is nothing else. Uh, I work. I work on this podcast. Uh, work on this podcast some more. I don't know. Mel and I just get to enjoy. Mel and I just get to enjoy each other's company sometimes. I game What's that like. Uh, it's good. Yeah, I I know it's fleeting. For I sure. forget my wife's name from time to time. We actually talk so infrequently these days because we're just dealing with a child each. Uh, I read a stat the other day that said uh, a household. You're gonna hate this. A household with two young children. Twenty nine weeks of the year. At tw- I know, right? I, don't I get saw it. it too. 29 weeks out of the year in a household with two young children. 29 weeks of the year, somebody is sick. <laughs> More than half the year, somebody's sick. Oh, in this household. is a stat. Oh, it's, sorry. I thought this was some sort of cliche saying. No. It could be both. If 29 we're weeks of the year, someone's sick. If yeah. you have two small kids in your house. Man, I feel like it'd be way higher than that. Oh, that's- I feel like the parents, you know, the young parents I work with are always sick. I've, it could be seasonal because since the beginning of November, uh, we we maybe had maybe, and I'm not even exaggerating, had three weeks where nobody's not been sick in the house. Um, okay, so just to move us forward into the trades here, the Red Wings, um, we talk about them plenty, so we'll come back to them another time. We let's talk about the uh, trade deadline. So some, the trades actually started rolling in already. Um, Monday might be the most boring day of the year. Yeah, who's left? This happens all the time. When was our last episode? February 17th. Uh, That was the Blake Coleman trade, right? We talked about that. So Blake Coleman obviously set a bar for, you know, that caliber of player where Nolan Foote in the first went back. Uh, The Vancouver Canucks got Tyler Toffoli. Already scored. Yes. From LA for uh, Tim Schaller, Tyler Madden, a second and a fourth, which is kind of crazy, right? Not the price for Tyler Toffoli, because as we've seen, the rental market this year is stupid, and that's actually, based on what everybody else has got, a very reasonable price for Tyler Toffoli. Vancouver gives up their third or fourth best prospect, one who's probably only a year or two away from actually competing in Tyler Madden. Second round pick's not an insignificant piece. Schaller was just probably to make the salary work. Um, And the fourth round pick, whatever. Um, it's the fact that it was Vancouver who did it that is confusing to me. Because even though Toffoli makes them better, even if Brock Besser and Josh Levo come back for the playoffs, does anybody view them as a serious cup contender this year? Just Vancouver. Look, you know, we we can say all the time that this uh, one team or another isn't a serious cup contender. Vancouver is likely going to make the playoffs and... They have a chance. You have Hughes, you have Pedersen, and then if Markstrom goes is a hot goalie, there's your contender. The West is literally the wild, wild West. So what the Pacific is, what odds do you give Vancouver of walking through a Dallas, Colorado, or St. Louis in the conference? Right now they play the Golden Knights. That is not a good first round matchup for another team that's also stockpiling. Yeah, for a team that's regressing back to its mean after like an unnaturally poor start. You know, they were shooting below their pace. and everything. Their goaltending was terrible. Yeah. And who also just picked up Alec Martinez. Yes. So. First uh, has never been more important in that division. No, no. And you know what? I agree with you guys. I don't think Vancouver should be the. Like, if it's up to me, I don't think they should be gunning. But you also like I've given Jim Benning a healthy amount of criticism. But this is a guy that has Elias Pettersson, Quinn Hughes, a good goaltender. 
and some pretty solid pieces. Do I think his asset management is good? No. Do I think he's made some pretty weird contract decisions? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, do I think his timing and lack of a commitment to an actual like retool or rebuild is not for the best for the long-term future of this team? Yeah, absolutely. I don't like this trade at all that he made for Tyler Toffoli. But he has Patterson and Hughes, and that just changes everything. There's no team. This, If you're going to label a team a dark horse, this is the team that fits that mold to a T. They're young, no expectations, and they're ahead of where we thought they would be. And we don't think they're going to do much in the playoffs. Translation, though, of Vancouver being a dark horse, and a synonym of dark horse is objectively bad. Hence why they're a dark horse. Because you, you're not a dark horse if people expect you to do well. You, Evan's right. If any team could come out of nowhere to go on a run, it's a team with a goalie who's as good as Jakob Markstrom has been this year, who has a superstar up front like Elias Pettersson and a wild card in the sense that Brock Besser uh, could be back for playoffs. So it's conceivable that they absolutely could get hot. But to me, Vancouver getting hot at the right time in the playoffs maybe carries them to the conference finals. I could see them taking out of Vegas if everything goes right for them. They get to the second round to play probably it would be another Pacific division team. So let's say Calgary, I could see them taking out Calgary and then they run into Dallas, St. Louis or Colorado in the conference final. And I don't see them having a snowball's chance in hell against any of those three teams. No, I I think it's going to be the central or Vegas to come out of the West for sure. Not for sure, but that would be my, my gut. Tyler Toffoli has cup wins, right? Yeah. Yep. So that's another piece to the puzzle. I don't really know if they have anyone else on their roster who has that experience. Tyler Toffoli's line mate from those cup wins, Tanner Pearson. Oh, yeah, that's right. Uh, (laughs) Jay Beagle from Washington. Oh, my God. Okay. Does Jay Beagle play regularly for them? Oh, yeah. He's making almost $4 million, so he better be. Oh, my God. He's their Luke Lendenning. Wow. Yeah, he is their Wow. Except literally probably not as good as Luke Lindenning. Yeah, I wonder. You know what? I <laughs> and for s- double the money. <laughs> so they do have cup experience, but it never hurts to add someone who's got more. And uh, I don't know if Tanner Pearson's playing with Toffoli right now in terms of their depth chart, but it's ki- he's kind of a good fit on that team. I mean, look, if they want to go for it, then you have to be okay with that trade. If you're in favor of teams going for it, you have to make that, you have to be okay with uh, Benning making that trade. But the question is, are they at the same tier as, you know, a Vegas who's making a move to go for it or a Pittsburgh who's making a move to go for it or anything like that? People people say it, say it all the time. All I need to do is get in and then anything can happen. Here's, and you know, that is very cliche, but if there's, Stranger things have happened. More this so, is a league of parody. More so than any other seven game series sport, I'd say for sure. But still, yeah, I don't know. It would take the world of them to go right. All this trade reminds me of, and again, we relate everything back to the Red Wings because it's what we do. Tyler Toffoli is a higher end David Leguan, Eric Cole. Mm-hmm. These are the same type of trades that at the time we knew were objectively stupid and were going to hurt the team in the long run with probably little to no reward in the playoffs. And I don't know the Red Wings ever won a round with any of those guys in the lineup. So this is this is what I'm feeling with Vancouver here. Again, Detroit at the time didn't have a Pedersen, didn't have a Hughes. Yeah. So I, I definitely see the difference here. Um, Toffoli, too, is probably going to be a pure rental. Even if they like him, they are one of the teams most screwed for cap space right now to the point where they're not even sure they can keep Jakob Markstrom next year um, because Pedersen... They're going to lose one of Demko or Markstrom. Yeah, they're going to have to. And, you know, Pedersen and Hughes and are going to be due up for contracts soon. It's not going to be an easy situation there because Vancouver's mismanagement of the cap, this is where I'm defending the trade, is... Yeah, they might legitimately, even with these young superstars, regress next year. Because if, as good as Demko is, I don't think if he's their starter next year, he's going to put up the kind of season Markstrom's putting up this year. No, I, I just looked up Tyler Toffoli's on ice impact and I really undersold the guy. No, he's a really, really good player. Like Tyler Toffoli was one of the better rentals available on the market. But again, is he enough of a needle mover that you're going to say, even with JT Miller playing the way he is, even with Pedersen, even with Hughes, even when Besser comes back, are the Vancouver Canucks a cup contender? And I'd be hard pressed to find anybody to say yes. If it, 
you know what? I'll never fault a GM who thinks their team is good and they want to strike when they think the iron's hot. Oh, whereas, where, whereas where the Red Wings, we were just striking at the cold iron that was well, should have been turned off years before. Ken Holland thought the team was good at the time. Uh, yeah, well, we probably did too with some sort of rose-tinted glasses in some aspect. But I think Vancouver is on the up rather than the down, regardless of where they are in terms of the cap. So I can't fault the GM for, for wanting to go for it this year. He's getting career highs out of several players and um that's what you do you got you got to win all right let's look uh what other trades happened here so it was uh dylan Demello to the jets um in a, from ottawa in exchange for a third round pick which was weird that's... yeah Demello's not that good mike green might get a third round pick now legitimately if they trade him i my, i thought that was an underpayment yeah one of my buddies who's a very, yeah, is a very die-hard uh, Sens fan, um, and has I would say a good outlook or has a good grasp on on hockey, mm-hmm. and he viewed it as a massive underpayment. He said Demello is a very very strong defense defensive defenseman. Yeah, it seems like he's he plays that third pairing role to a T. Marco Scandella third pairing. Keywords there. Yeah, well, Marco Scandella, Alec Martinez both went for way more than that. Like these, like, it didn't really align with the, the rest of the market. So. Brendan Dillon got a second and a third. Yeah. This market is stupid. And if the one year the Red Wings don't have any valuable rentals, well, this is the irony that we're historically bad and have no good rentals. The one year everybody's overpaying. I mean, it makes sense. You're not historically bad if you have good pieces, right? Remember what the return on Gus Nyquist was? No. Does he get a first <laughs> plus this year? Yes. Yeah. Like, this is insane. I'm actually angry at the... Like, objectively, I know it's a good thing because it means the pieces Detroit does move will get more. But I'm actually angry because, damn it, where's our Nyquist to trade now? Where's our... Well, it makes the Tatar first, second, and a third deal look reasonable for Vegas. I didn't realize that second round pick was Master Simone. Yeah. That was that pick. Yeah. Valeno and Master Simone right now? Oh, my God. Yeah, they're not And a bad. pick to come still. Yeah. I mean, it's a third, but still... Hey, and don't forget we have San Jose's third this year, which is going to be basically a late second. Uh, Ottawa, yeah, Ottawa gets a third from Winnipeg, which I thought, you know, they could have got more. That's a good deal for Winnipeg. Good, It is. And especially with this whole Bufflin thing ironing out, or at least they know for certain that he's probably not going to come back and never be a Jet again. Uh, it makes sense for them to try to shore that up. Uh, Brendan Dillon to the Capitals for a second and a third. Colorado's second and Washington's third. Um, and there's a condition that I'm not even going to bother reading. It. Hey, second year in the row, Washington traded for a, a defenseman and gave up a second round pick plus. This is their, they had Kempney first and then they did uh, Nick Jensen, who is rumored to maybe even be moved from Washington because he's not quite working out there for them. And uh, who is he traded for again? A second round pick and Madison Bowie. What a fantastic trade that was. I wouldn't, I would not call Madison Bowie a fantastic addition. Washington is trying to get rid of Jensen in some circumstances. Oh, oh, fantastic trade. Oh, yeah, that's a fantastic trade because they got a second for Jensen. And Madison Bowie is turning out to be a pleasant surprise. I don't... Uh, again. <laughs> I, 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 hey, historically bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just saying there's been numerous people pointing out his improved defensive game over the last weeks, which... Before you say anything, it's still bad, but improved. <laughs> There's a heartbeat. There's a heartbeat. It's like we're at the point where Undertaker's in the casket and his eyes have opened, but he hasn't quite sat up yet. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the hands come out of the grave from the soil. Yeah, he might still be tired and go back to sleep. But if Ma- Okay, look. <laughs> I don't even know how to quantify this, but if Madison Bowie ends up being a passable defensive player ever jeff blashell jack adams winner if that I, happens. I will give you a hundred dollars oh i can't and wait I, to see what gallant can do with him i know how much a hundred dollars means to you right now <laughs> that's that's a week worth of gross weeks worth of groceries for one of my kids well thankfully I, the other one's still eating for free does mika still need to eat how old is she she's almost four does she not hunt, get a job she's not hunt her own food yet <laughs> not a hunter gatherer no, that kid's just a tornado. Um, 
Yeah, you know what? That's the price that the market was set at, say, for Ottawa. So it makes sense for Washington, who's still very much in their window. So can't blame them. And speaking of teams in their window, Marco Scandella to the St. Louis Blues uh, in exchange for a second and a fourth. These prices are crazy. This is stupid. I can't... Stri- Mediocre defensemen are going for second round picks plus. We've got lots of those. Plus! Legitimately, this makes me think we might actually get something tangible for Green and Daly. Um, If Buffalo fans weren't already mad at their team, on January 2nd, Buffalo traded Scandella to the Habs. January 2nd of this year, traded Scandella to the Habs for a fourth round pick. Not only did the Habs get that fourth round pick back, but they got a second as well. Free second round pick. It's beautiful. And they might do even more than that with Ilya Kovalchuk still. How do you mess that up if you're Jason Botterill? Uh, they, they, Zach Bogosian was on their team, right? No, they waved and, him. They waved and then him. he re- refused. Like, judging by these market prices, is he is Zach Bogosian that bad? Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, I guess no one claims his, him, right? His, so, yeah. <laughs> and for perspective, he has one goal this year. And on that one goal, he absolutely walked Justin Ablocator just to rub it. Salt oh, in the wounds. Nice. I need to watch that. And you also, no, you really, really don't. His salary is five points. Oh yeah, never one, mind. four, two. That's a lot. Yes. Hey, good for him. Uh, a couple minor league deals, both involving Toronto. Uh, actually, uh, Malgin, not Malkin, Malgin that they got from Florida is a, probably like a fourth line player for them, which is good uh, for Toronto. Uh, Vegas got Alec Martinez for two second round picks, one this year and one next year. Well, he says justifiable because he's got another year left on his contract. Yeah. Do you love Alec Martinez? Though? I do not. I don't think he's a two seconds player. Uh, I've heard a fun stat. Um, LA's Stanley Cup winning overtime goal from 2014. All three of the players who factored in that goal have been traded in the last month. Huh. Well, Tinez, Toffoli, and Clifford. Well, because LA knows what, what team they are now and what they need to do. And that started with Kovalchuk leaving, and they're properly rebuilding now. Well, they're going to look dumb when Kovalchuk gets traded for a first-round pick, and they just let him walk. Well, he walked away. They they got free to the cap hit, though, right? That's fair. And he walked away from $4 million or whatever it was. I guess walked away from more money than anyone else I can remember. Yeah, it blows my mind. Uh, and all the other deals that have happened have just been like minor league AHL deals. So that's where we're at right now. We are currently at, um, you know, middle middle tier players are going for top tier prices. And I think that's because there's not a lot of top tier players. For example, these are the top trade bait pieces as per TSN's trade board. Chris Kreider, number one, obviously, we still don't know what's happening there. Sammy Votnin in New Jersey, who's not having a particularly great year. Uh, J.G. Pajot out of Ottawa, Vlad Nemesnikov out of Ottawa. There, we've we've gone past the objectively good players. Kovalchuk, Athanasiu, Eric Gustafson out of Chicago, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, not bad players on here, but you don't have any game breakers. No, not I would argue you don't have a game breaker on that board. Uh, and that's okay. It's almost never going to happen where game breakers are out there. I think Chris Kreider is an int- interesting situation with what they do with him. Um, I put out a question on Twitter, which I wanted to. Oh, geez. Yeah. Yeah. So I asked people to give me trades that they think are most likely to happen anywhere across the league and a more, uh, a mo- their most realistic trade involving the Red Wings. Um, Paul Hoffman. I'm just reading these without filtering them. So if I'm reading not good ones, I apologize to you too. Uh, Paul Hoffman says, Bufflin and Logan Stanley slash Hynola from Mike Green and Darren Helm. Yep. Not happening. The Paul, you're right that Jets would get seven and a half million off the books, but they would not want to give up Hinola for that. Uh, Beer League Chump says Kreider to Boston for a first and a prospect is sounds about right. I heard Boston wasn't big on giving up a first for Coleman, but Kreider might be worth it for them. Uh, Helm to Edmonton for Jujar Kyra and a third makes sense. I could very definitely see that. How would you feel about that? I would feel fantastic about the third round pick. Uh, Moose says Athens U for Pugliarvi, a second, and Cooper Marodi. Uh, close to reasonable. Not sure how I would feel about that because I'm not one of the bigger Pugliarvi believers. Louis Erickson, Thatcher Demko, and Ole Olevi, and a third for 
Bernier or Bernier in a fourth. No, that's too much from. That's way, way. too much. From I Vic thought Cooper. that Athanasiu was going to be the answer there. Yes. Uh, Mike Green to Edmonton for a late round pick or daily to whoever is dumb enough to get him for a bag of pucks and some dry Ireland. <laughs> Thank yes. you. Albany Red Wings. Um, Rest in peace, Terry says, what do we have to trade and to who to get Terry back? And I think Terry lives on in all of us. Would there not be some irony if Anaheim and Detroit swung a trade in which Detroit got Troy Terry? Um, Jake Helm says, JG Pajot to Boston for a second, a conditional fourth or fifth, and John Beecher. Ba- oh, I was going to say Beecher there makes that a little more sense. Because based on the current market, Pajot is a first right now. Pajot should oh, yeah. Be, yeah. Which uh, is insane to me, which I feel like I need to specify with everything I'm saying. Luke Glendening to the Islanders for a third. I could see it. Sure. Would you do that? Mm, I think on the current market, Glendening's worth a second, but I still don't bet on that happening because at some point over the next few days, I'm assuming reasonable gems, like common sense prevails. We're going to have a market correction. Yeah. Yeah. Hopefully not an overcorrection. <laughs> Joe Thornton to Tampa Bay for third and a prospect. Uh, Thornton's definitely getting more. That would have to be a significant prospect. This is from Return of Tag and Athens. You trade to the Rangers for Georgiev. For I, what New York has turned down, I don't think they're doing that. No, I don't think so. Kovalchuk to the and Bruins. I would not do that as a Red Wings GM. Well, yeah, well, I guess with Bernie's play Sorry, right what now, what was the trade? Athens you for Georgiev. No, with Bernie's play right now, you're almost okay. Your whole, you have something to hold you over at goaltending for a little while. You know there's a bunch of teams who are running into goaltender issues in terms of having too many. Vancouver, New York. We may as well wait them out until yeah. we don't have to give up a prime asset. You want to hear my... I, I've been reading a bunch of things and thinking about a bunch of things lately. Uh-oh. You want to hear my my hot take for the episode? Uh-oh. The hottest of takes? I don't think Athens Sioux gets traded this weekend. I think he's part of a trade at the draft to get up into the middle of the first round to get Askarov. That's a hot take. That's really hot. I will it's give you a hundred dollars if that happens. I, it's a long shot, but Eisenman's done it before. Vasilevsky. Just saying. Is there a Cal Quincy out there? I mean, Eisenman right. literally has a history of taking Russian trading to take Russian goalies in the teens. <laughs> I, he'd have to dr- trade up pretty high, though. I don't think Askarov's falling much past. 10 I was well. looking. It's going to depend on where teams land, and right now, I don't think Askarov gets past. Wherever San Jose pick. Oh, wait a minute. They're not picking. Exactly. So it could happen. <laughs> Yakaruta. Kovalchuk to the Bruins for a second is very realistic. Mike Green to Edmonton for a third I would be thrilled with. Ryan May says Sammy Votnin. If Dylan DeMello is worth a third round pick, Mike Green's worth a second. I don't think One so. can play defense, though. Yeah. I- One can play offense. <laughs> can he even play? He's usually hurt. He's been fine the last few weeks. <laughs> what a vote Re- of confidence there's no such thing as recency bias what an iron man someone's got to be an optimist here what is made of steel ryan mace is sammy votnin to the hurricanes for toronto's first round pick mm-hmm. i wouldn't give up that first for sammy votnin i won't lie if toronto misses the playoffs that's pick 17 carolina's not hurting for defense are they well yeah. hamilton's injury didn't help them but he'll be back uh athens you to edmonton for pulley rv in a second that's didn't that was not trade already said? Yeah, something similar. Helm salary retained or Glenn Denning to Colorado for a third. I could see that. Colorado has a need for bottom six forwards. Um Glenn Denning to Columbus for a third. Helm straight up for Jost. You yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, if you're a Red Wings fan, yes. Um it's a lot of Kovalchuk trades here, and that makes a lot of sense. I think Helm and Glenn Denning, in a funny way, are the most likely to be moved because nobody wants to pay the premium for Athens CU because Athens CU is a 30 goal scorer who's not currently a 30 goal scorer. So teams don't want to pay for someone who's not a 30 goal scorer, and the Eisman won't want to sell someone who was a 30 goal scorer. So, want to hear my favorite stat of the day? Hmm. If Andreas Athens CU was simply just shooting his career average shooting percentage this year he'd be on pace for 26 oh. so if you wonder how shooting percentages affect perceived performance there you go athens has been shooting basically half of his normal shooting percentage this year and he's not scoring but he's still creating chances so he's shooting like six or seven percent this season right now his career average is 12 point something so if he was shooting that 12 point something right now over an 82 game pace he'd be scoring at a 26 goal pace I mean, 
he's not bad. He sucks defensively, and I think we can't ever try to justify that argument anymore. He's bad at it. Every metric, the eye test, he just sucks in his own end. But he still creates offense. And he does it on a line with schlubs. He's pretty, I think he's, pre- compared to what's been moved, he's pretty underrated on this trade board. I think Athens is CU. I think that trade board's based on, like, it's kind of like a hybrid of most likely to yeah. be traded versus their value. And that's fair. Because I don't think Athens is CU is as likely to be moved as, like, a Kreider or a Pajot. I still, I don't know. I'm still moving him for a first. Depends who's first. Carolina's first, yes. Toronto's first. Carolina has Toronto's first. Oh, mm, yes. Oh right. God, yeah. That might not. That might be a lottery pick. Well, it's lottery protected. It's you know what I mean. It could be picked like twelve. Yeah. Um, Fun fact: There's also a based on current point total projections, or at least as of yesterday when I was reading this, uh, Toronto is statistically on pace to miss the playoffs in the East, while also being on pace points wise to finish first in the Pacific. Yeah. They, this system is stupid and bad. It's all it's all wacky. Toronto fans, I actually kind of feel for right now because don't don't. This is how they get you. Don't. They're losing their minds, and there's this whole chorus of people screaming, "Fire Dubis, fire Dubis!" And it's like, why? Since Sheldon Keith came in, the Leafs have been playing at like a hundred and nine point pace or something like that, which is very well above the threshold to make the playoffs. But it's just that they had such a bad start with Babcock that they had to hold those two. Leafs fans will never be happy. No, they could sweep the Cup finals. And they would still find something to complain about. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, okay, so Chris Kreider, is he getting moved? What do we think? Does New York take advantage of that situation and move him for assets right now? Or do they try to hang on to him as a key part of their team throughout their rebuild? I'm not going to pretend I know or even have a good guess as to what they're going to do. But they should trade him because how many times have we seen teams... Spend way too much money, put way too much term to keep a decent player around who's almost 30. Um, so they're either going to have to give him an absolutely horrendous contract that's probably not going to age well within the next two to three years, or they could move him for an absolute king's ransom right now. So if I were Jeff Gordon, I know what I would be doing. Now, and what do you do if you're like a bubble team? Like if, if you're a Calgary, if you're in Arizona or a Winnipeg, um, or in the East, if you're like a fringe team like the Maple Leafs, Columbus, the Islanders, Carolina, what are you doing there? It's all subjective. Do I think my team's actually good enough? I could see Toronto buying because I think if they got a save and they traded for a defenseman, they could be a cup contender, even though they're a bubble team right now. If I'm a bubble team like anybody in the Pacific or Winnipeg or Nashville, I'm not doing a damn thing because I'm still very much of the mindset. If you're not one of the... Six or seven best teams in the league, don't buy. Just don't, because the way you win the cup isn't by adding an insignificant piece on your second line that's going to maybe get you an extra win. It's you're going to have a goalie get stupid hot at the right time. And, you know, with some wizardry voodoo and some potions, you might win a few rounds. So, yeah, every year there shouldn't be more than a handful of teams buying, and they have to be like legit contenders. And I'd be surprised if off the top of my head there's more than eight teams that I would buy as if I were the GM of them. What about Edmonton? I would not. M- mid-round picks to get like to shore up some holes, like legitimately like a third or fourth round pick for Darren Helm to shore up your bottom six. Sure. Because the most overvalued things in hockey are third, fourth, fifth round picks mm-hmm. because they turn out less than 12% of the time, but yet people still treat them like gold. Obviously, I'm not saying that they're not valuable because if you acquire 10 third round picks, you're going to hit on one of them. So you need to get as many of them as you can. Um, but no, I don't I don't add if I'm in Edmonton uh, other than spare parts. For the cost it would take to get Kreider, there's very few teams that fill that or are willing to take that risk. Edmonton, let's say you have to give up a first for Chris Kreider, which by all intents and purposes, yes, that's what it's going to take minimum. First plus. A minimum. So Edmonton still needs their first round pick if they don't make the playoffs. Even if they do and they're out in the first round, they still need a mid first round pick to start filling in some of these holes in their roster. And unless you're 25 to 31, I don't think you take a run, you take a run at them unless you get a discount price, but the way things are going, that's not happening. So 
there's five teams that should be looking at him. St. Louis is the one that comes to my mind. I have no idea what their cap situation is like, but or their resources in terms of picks, but he would fit in really nice there. Yeah. St. Louis, honestly, like good for them. I think they've done a good job of uh, having another strong year after an unexpected Stanley Cup. And they don't have Tarasenko. And they don't have Tarasenko, and he's going to come back, right? Yep. And who knows what he's been doing in Russia. He's going to have like one robotic leg. Like he's gonna be like the guy from the what's that Rocky Four, Rocky Five. Uh, fun fact: I've never watched anything. Oh no! Rocky. Oh no! Yeah, we should stop the episode now. Now that's it. That's your line. No, that's not it. We'll keep going. Uh, Sammy Votnin is something that's surprising to me. If New Jersey can make out and get a premium asset back for Sammy Votnin, then good for Tom Fitzgerald over there. Um, Pierre Dorian in Ottawa is like. I don't really know if he's the best for them right now in terms of maximizing their assets. Um, I'm saying that knowing full well that his trade with San Jose to get uh, a first round pick back from them in exchange for Eric Carlson is probably what's going to land him Alexi Lafreniere, but I digress. Um, Montreal has done a surprisingly good job, you know, flipping Scandella for the same price they got him for and an additional second round pick and they get Ilya Kovalchuk for free and they're going to sell him for an asset there's a lot of um decent players there's a lot of decent tier players available here for teams i still think you know if an edmonton picks up athens cu or a dallas friedman mentioned dallas on 31 thoughts um there's whatever teams could use a speedy winger that's not expected to be too responsible for anything else other than just generating offense someone's someone can pick up athens you and make out like a bandit like that is a whole other scoring threat on your in your top six or even on your third line if you have a good enough center for him that you wouldn't have considered if you're edmonton and you make the playoffs do you really want freaking zach cassian playing on your first line no they just paid him like he should be oh uh, who paid him ken holland mm. yeah ken holland what was his last project like anyways Someone's better. I just like you. <laughs> Look, I still maintain Ken Holland should have a statue when it's all said and done, uh, wherever the Red Wings are playing. But right now, the um, the Red Wings are playing through his manifestation of a team. I mentioned like Wand and Cole this episode and triggered him. You mentioned what? Like Wand and Cole. Oh, yeah, yeah. That instantly, I was just like, oh, God. Yeah, well. And the. The trade that got Tampa Vasilevsky. I'm dead inside. All right. Red Wings roster. I want you guys to say uh, yes or no. That they're traded? Yes. Yes. Okay. We're done. The whole team. The whole team Everyone. is traded. We've traded them straight up for... Everyone wants to see the Grand Rapids Griffins prospects play. Here you go. We're Bringing do... the whole team up. We're going to do the whole team. This one's tough. Including Terry. Chris Terry. Just an applicator. <laughs> please. <laughs> yes or no? Our answer is please. Andreas Athens, you. This isn't what you want. It's what you think. Will I happen. still get the gut feeling he's more likely to be moved in the off season this, than this weekend. I'll just say yes because I think there's a lot of teams who are thinking this is their year, and uh, he fits the bill. I still think that a lot of teams Athens, you is going to be their plan B or C. So unless Kreider yeah. or Pajot fall early. Yeah, uh, Detroit might, even if they want to trade him, might run out of time. Uh, I'll say no, because I don't think anyone ponies up the price that Steve Eisenman would want for him, considering the market right now. Uh, Tyler Bertuzzi. No. Christopher N. <laughs> Why? Adam Ernie. Please. Who cares? Robbie Fabry. No. No, I don't think so. Sorry, what's the, the yes, preface? Yes or no, do you think he's being traded? Think he's being traded? Yeah. No, but every man's got their price. Uh, Valtteri Filippula. No. Please. Luke Glendening. Uh, oh, I'm going to say no. I don't think he would, but I can see a world where there might be a framework deal that could be made. There will be calls. I'm yep. I'm like a 51-49 in favor of no, but I think there's going to be people kicking tires heavily. Can I specify, too, that this is what we think is going to happen, not what we would do? Because yes. uh, I think I would have had like one no so far. If I, th <laughs> if I think, then if I think, will it happen? I'll say no. Uh, Darren Helm. I'm going to say yes. He's having a surprisingly strong season. I bet you there'll be suitors. He's looked good lately. Sorry, recently. So I'll say yes. 
I'm going to say yes as well because I think this is the team's last really strong chance to move him. Salary uh, retained, maybe. I was going to say caveat. I think they'll have to retain salary because he still has another year left on his contract at a very unfavorable cap hit. Which really, yeah, and it really doesn't matter because the Red Wings are swimming in cap. Um, the next two are no Larkin, Mantha. Yeah, no, no. no. This one's close. Franz Nielsen. <laughs> <laughs> Please. Uh, Brendan Perlini and Philip Zadina, obvious no's. no's. Alex Biega, no. no. Madison Bowie is like, I'm going to say no, but I wouldn't be surprised if someone calls about him. If he gets a decent return in a trade, I'm taking full credit for it for improving his reputation. Yeah, yeah. you know what? I actually believe it. <laughs> he <laughs> I must. Heard Steve Eisman listens to the podcast. Yeah, of course. And he, uh, well, and you know, Madison Bowie is giving Brad a cut to raise. His Doesn't matter. As well. Doesn't matter if Steve Eisman listens to the podcast. Ken Holland listens to the podcast. Exactly. Trevor Daly. I'm going to say yes, uh, because I think Detroit's going to literally try to give him away. There are teams, everyone in the league seems to love this guy. So if we can somehow pull some voodoo magic and trade him for anything, this could be our um, Jakob Kindle. I'm almost willing to put money on him going back to Pittsburgh. (laughs) Uh, Trevor Daly, if he's healthy, yeah. Yeah, Danny DeKais is hurt. I'll still say no about (laughs) Daly, though. Okay. You, you, think you don't think anybody... The only way he doesn't get traded if nobody is even willing to take him for a conditional seventh. Think about it. Nick Cronwall last year with how he played still got a uh, offer of a sixth round pick for him from Columbus or something like that. I'm still saying no. Uh, Nick Cronwall last year, was as he was, was twice as good as Daly is this year. Yes. Uh, so we'll get a 12th round pick. Jonathan Erickson, no. Mike Green? I'm going to say yeah, again, with how desperate the defense market seems to be. Uh, and I think we will even be pleasantly surprised by the return on him. I was going to say yes as well. And I think all these early trades for defensemen have really thinned out the market. And teams who didn't get in on that action are kind of scratching their head at who's left. And in walks Mike Green. Oh, yeah. Park him on your third pairing, second power play. I could see some offense out of him. Uh, Heronic Lindstrom and Nemeth are all no's for I sure. I think Nemeth would have some suitors. I don't think it'll happen, but I wouldn't be surprised if there's conversations. Okay. Jonathan Bernier. I'm going to say no. Someone's got to stop pucks in Detroit for the next year and a half. Is Are any teams looking for a goalie right now? A few, I think. Colorado is, which is remarkable to me because Grubauer and Francis have been good this year. Grubauer's hurt. For how long? Uh, seemed long term. Oh, did it? I'm, I'm not sure. I, I actually don't know. Don't quote me on that. Uh, I'll look it up. But yeah, maybe I'm dumb. But did Bernie play for them? He yep. did. He did. Uh, Grubauer update. Anyhow, uh, Colorado's like. They- if you are du- if you th- are need a goalie super badly and you don't think you're back up, like a Hutchinson scenario, let's say it's like that, then yeah, you call Detroit to get Bernie. Bernier is probably the best goalie that's going to be reasonably available. Yeah. Grubauer out indefinitely. Oh, cool. That narrows it down. So when's he coming back? It's, it's not certain. Indefinitely. That was a joke. Oh, I couldn't tell by your face. No, it was a joke. Oh, what? You're funnier than us? Grow up. Uh, Jimmy Howard, no. Obviously no. not. I, I think Jonathan Bernier, no, but that's because the price is going to be inflated a little bit because, like Brad said, someone does need to stop pucks in Detroit for the next couple of years. That said, I think the price, the threshold for Eisenman to move him is a lot lower than we're giving him credit for. I don't think it's as high as a first. I think a second would do it for Jonathan Bernier with how he's playing right now. Team like Colorado, obviously a very strong team. Kadri and but again it's relevant if it's Colorado because are you giving up pick are you taking pick 57 for a guy who's going to be your only capable the only capable goaltender in your entire system right now yes okay. I am I am because I, I understand that it's not we need Bernie to be a stopgap we he's not going to be the goalie of the future if we get more second round picks it's just going to be his trade fodder to move up for Askarov that, so he can start for us next year that's fine by me honestly that's fine by me Sure. I'll, I'll play into your theory. <laughs> so, hey, we got a, we got a lot of time before the draft. We need theories, and we need to get weird. Barring a trade happening, like, immediately after we record, uh, we will come back to you guys Monday with how the trade deadline shakes down, what to look for, uh, how teams behaved in terms of being buyers and sellers. Um, I think the whole buying and selling thing, like you mentioned, Brad, is 
our school of thinking is a little bit different than what happens in the league. I think the NHL GMs are a lot more, uh, you know, liberal in terms of what they think a contender might be because they've seen St. Louis's and then because they've seen this league is a copycat league. Yeah. Oh yeah. Through and through. So Edmonton where, uh, Ken Holland has to sit down with Connor McDavid before the season and say, look, stay, we're going to need a year or two to figure this thing out, but I promise I'm going to build around you. And all of a sudden, you know, that thing happens where if you have Connor McDavid and Leon Dreisaitl, you're going to win a ton of games. They're currently first in the Pacific. Uh, they're going to be in the playoffs, and Ken Holland has to figure out whether he wants to capitalize on that. Like, all these teams are in very delicate situations. Colorado, who has a strong team for years to come and needs to be considerate of their very well-managed cap space because they have a lot of big names to pay soon, do they try to add to make a run this year, or do they write off this year and try to go with what they have? Like, I don't you need to be so in tune yeah. with your team and the non-injured and injured and underlying injured players. Like You need to know that better than you know yourself. And these GMs do that job incredibly well. So what we think might be a dumb move or what the public perceives as a, a strange move, these teams... These decisions are made with all knowledge known. Yeah. And the the point of having to be in tune is a really strong one that we sometimes overlook. Because, like, as fans and people on Twitter and, you know, armchair GMs, it's really easy to look at a team situation and make a judgment. Because zero risk. One thing I always think about is how every, we do, everybody dogs on Blast. They're like, blah, blah, blah. But then you hear things about, like, how every single person thinks he's amazing. Like, I yeah. think he's a great guy. He's always been a, an amazing coach. But from the outside, it's it's hard to really perceive that. Um, update. There's no update. Uh, Canucks have tried the last few days for Wayne Simmons, but New Jersey couldn't make it work cap-wise. I don't know. New Jersey I couldn't. just reading that. Yeah, Vancouver wanted Simmons but couldn't make it cap-wise. Make it work. Also, I just saw a trade bait list for goalies at the deadline. It was Georgiev number one, Bernier number two. So it makes sense. Yeah, that's New, it. New York. Although there was like seven names on that list, so it's a little deeper than I guess we give it credit for. But all of that, to be fair, that included both of Chicago. And if there's players. any any people who should know about that list, it's us because we see all the backup goalies. We uh, saw Carey Price on Tuesday there, Evan. That's true. That was weird. Carey Price led in a Ufus. Ufus. That's what I said. Ufus. There's <laughs> liter- I think there's literally two E's before the first U. Two E's make a U sound. No. Ufus. He let in a Ufus. More like Doofus, and that's you. Uh, uh, speaking of Colorado's cap, people speculating that they would trade for Carey Price, and I can't, just can't imagine why they would trade for that contract, considering they have to soon pay some very, very, very strong players. Although those, Who? Who do they have to pay? Everybody's long-term there. Um, Bowen Byram. In Kale three Mc- years. If there's, if there's any team, McCarr in what? Two years. They might get it done. Well, yeah, I guess it'd be on the books in two years. Oh, yeah. I said Byron, but I think I meant McCarr in terms of he should be and next have, year, And right? he ain't making $22 million a year, so they'll still have a ton of cap space left after that. Uh, RFA is next year. They have Burakovsky. They have Tyson Jost. Uh, Nichushkin. Uh, Come back player. Uh, Zadorov. Ryan Graves. This is depressing how good of a position and how little dollars all these oh players are going to cost. Oh, my God. It's going to cost them nothing. Wow, wow, I'm not wow, saying Colorado wow. should trade for Carey Price. No, they still shouldn't. If there was anybody who could, though, it is absolutely them. You know what you don't do, though, to get yourself out of a good cap position? Make bad cap moves, like trade for a $10 million goalie when you don't need to. Do you think if they gave like Montreal a really good return, like a Bowen Byron, Montreal would be willing to retain some of the salary on it? Yes, I would if I'm Montreal. Uh, How Byron many years are left? Bowen on, Byron for Carey if, Price straight up with $2 million retained. On Carey Price? This is like um, inf- indefinite years. Yeah, I think he has. It's a lot. He's Yeah, he's got a lot of years left. Five, so then, five or six at least. Uh, man, imagine how good Carey Price would be behind a, a, a competent defensive core. Six years after this one. Oh, my after. goodness. Oh, boy. Yeah. And he just got lit up by Detroit in the third period. Detroit! Uh, 
We're going to uh, head over to overtime. This is uh, technically a midweek episode again. We're on a Monday, Thursday shift right now due to the trade deadline. Uh, patrons get their comments read out um, as our way of saying thank you for supporting the show. Um, lots of you guys have been telling me that you are uh, new listeners and that uh, you found the show one way or another. So thank you and welcome to the Winged Wheel podcast. Um, if you want to help support the show, tell a Red Wings fan friend. If you know a Red Wings fan and you think they would listen to podcasts, even if they don't already, tell them about us. Tell them to go to wingedwheelpodcast.com on our homepage. It shows you every single way you can listen to the show. And if you click that listen now button, it'll actually open the native uh, podcast player you have on your device, laptop or iPhone, or laptop or iPhone, laptop or phone, and it'll start playing the, po- the most recent episode. Um, subscribe, leave ratings on iTunes, subscribe on iTunes, uh, leave ratings on Spotify, subscribe on Spotify. Honestly, iTunes reviews and Spotify subscriptions and reviews are like great for us. So those are the ways you can support. All right. We're going to start with Sam M says, Hey guys, I have a really quick fun fact for you. Danny DeKaiser has more points this season than just an applicator. <laughs> Hopefully you're more capable of ignoring that uh, than I am because I'm ripping my hair out. Anyways, we swept Montreal. So there's something to come out of this train wreck. I miss Danny DeKaiser. I do too, and that's a horrifying fact from very uh, brand new patron Sam M. So welcome to the Dub Dub family, and uh, thank you for that horrifying, horrifying piece of knowledge. I feel like DeKaiser hasn't played a game since October. Uh, I feel like you're right. Uh, brand new name level sponsor, Dead Panda Society. Welcome and thank you so much. Uh, he says, hey dudes, I'm new to Patreon. Just want to support you all since you add entertainment to my life. How do you feel about tattoos about hockey? I got an Alex Ovechkin panda tattoo. It adds so much happiness to my life and I want more, but it was uh, what I wanted. Thanks and good luck on your podcast, family. Um, I need to see that Alex Ovechkin panda tattoo right now. I thought now. you said Alex Ovechkin panda tattoo, but I'm like, no, I definitely misheard something there. I definitely need this for context. I'm very pro sports tattoos. Just don't uh, ever get a tattoo of your team's championship banner before yeah. they get it, because that seems to be the trend of the year, and it's stupid. Fun fact, Evan has a uh, Red Wings 20, uh, 2009 Stanley Cup champion tattoo on his ass. Yep. And one under my hair. <laughs> Uh, thank you again, Dead Panda Society. Brad Smith says, fellas, just found the pod recently. Brad Smith, new name level sponsor. God, I love you guys. Fantastic name. Welcome to the Dub Dub family. I uh, just found the pod recently, enjoying the show. Lifelong Wings fan in Houston, where we've been going without pro hockey going on seven years. It's great to have this source of in-depth team content to reconnect with the Wings during the rebuild. I don't have much to add or inquire about the trade deadline, except I trust Stevie Wise's body of work I can see the light at the end of this long, dark tunnel. Thanks and keep up the great work. That is a great way to look at it. I I have, for the first time in years, complete faith in the GM of the Red Wings. Is that crazy? That's weird. a little wild. Feels weird, man. Um, Terry. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Rowan. Uh, this one's actually Justin. Oh, okay. Hi, yeah. Justin. Says hello. Terry says, hello, I finally gave this podcast a chance, and I want to inform you that you gained another follower. Can't wait to hear your next episode. <laughs> Arjun Shanker says... Arjun Shanker says, Arjun Shanker says, Arjun Shanker says, Arjun Shanker says. They're getting clever, eh? They're getting really... Becoming cheap. self-aware. Yeah, well, you said you would read it. You've uh, you got to put in an asterisk that you will edit as needed. Uh, I know I'm late, but congrats on your fifth anniversary. I know I give you all a hard time, but I'm very proud and happy for you guys. Oh, Aww. Arjun. I look forward to making you all uncomfortable at the next meeting where I'm shithoused. Meet up where I'm shithoused before you guys even show up. <laughs> I am very much here for shithouse Arjun. Uh, Nick Toyaz says, hey, guys, I'm sure you still don't have the best grasp on the upcoming draft yet. So this question will probably get posed later on. Oh, I'm getting there. But after reading Scott Wheeler's draft preview uh, article about Marco Rossi, why is he still ranked behind Byfield and Raymond? If he really is the complete center like the article is describing, shouldn't he be ranked accordingly? Also, if Detroit is picking two, do you still go with Byfield or does this make you pick Rossi? Thanks, boys, and congrats on five years and cheers to another five. Okay, so here's the problem with draft rankings. And because uh, player rankings are nuanced, it's hard to describe. Everything Scott Wheeler said about Marco Rossi is true. But what's hard to convey in text specifically is ranking and analyzing the actual amount of skill they have. Because Marco Rossi's skill is off the charts. And even though he's probably a, a more rounded player than Lucas Raymond, I would still argue Lucas Raymond's pure talent is above Rossi's. So even though Rossi's at a premium position, 
probably a more responsible overall player, a more complete player. I don't think his skill set is quite there at Lucas Raymond's yet. It's not far off, don't get me wrong. Uh, right now in my own rankings in my head, Marco Rossi is very firmly in my top five. Um, but is he ahead of a Raymond or a Byfield? I wouldn't say so yet. I'm closer in my own head to putting Stutzla and Raymond ahead of Byfield than I am Rossi. But he's not that far behind. And it's it's tough, too, because even if you look at Raymond, Stutzla, Rossi, they are three very different players. Raymond is your um, just creative, uber-skilled, playmaking type forward a la a Mitch Marner. Tim Stutzla is your north-south speed and skill for days, kind of your rich man's Athens CU, whereas Marco Rossi is more of your Patrice Bergeron type, if you will. So it's... It's hard to compare apples to apples since they are such different players. Um, I don't think Byfield has a lock on number two either, but I'm still not betting against him because his raw tools are just so good. Outside of what Brad um, very aptly mentioned there, uh, another big thing for Rossi is that, um, you know, the Lafreniers, the uh, Byfield, and even Stutzla with his speed and Raymond, um, they pose a realistic chance of translating game-breaking talent into the NHL. Not saying Marco Rossi can't, but typically when you're looking for a guy who's touted as such a complete player, you pull back from some other aspects. And that's not a bad thing. I think what the Red Wings need is a number one center who is a complete player. Absolutely. Imagine having Rossi and Larkin down the middle. That'd be amazing. But the fact that he's a year older, he's 5'9", um, and he doesn't have one aspect of this game that is like absolutely earth shattering. Like other prospects very well might means he has a little bit more to overcome before he moves up a ranking list. And is that to say those players are definitely going to translate like that? No, absolutely not. There's a, there's always a chance that Byfield or even Lafreniere or whoever else, you know, something misses a step and it doesn't quite land in the NHL. And if someone is a premier goal scorer that doesn't show up in the show, um, but if you're drafting top three or top four, you kind of have to take a crack at elite talent when you have it. And also, we I, I hate bringing it up because it, it's such an old thing and a lot of people uh, use it as an excuse to overvalue bad players. But given that Byfield and Raymond and Rossi and Stutzla's talent levels are so similar, I mean, only one of them is six foot four, two twenty. Mm hmm. So if you have a guy just as talented as Marco Rossi, but he's seven inches taller and like 50 pounds heavier, uh, Ty goes to the monster. <laughs> Regardless of how, if you're built like a brick shit house, like at some point your height becomes something you have to overcome and you have to overcome that at every single level. Mm -hmm. And it gets far more difficult as you progress through the ranks. Like there are some absolute monsters in the NHL, and even if you're five nine and wide as a damn truck, it's still something that will forever be a risk in a GM's mind, regardless of all the analytics. Yeah, and, go ahead. Yeah, and also it's worth mentioning too uh, when comparing these guys because you see uh, just Marco Rossi's raw stats this year versus we'll use Lucas Raymond as the example here. And you're like, oh my God, like how is Lucas Raymond has a third of the points Marco Rossi does, but Lucas Raymond is already playing against men in a professional league and one of the best leagues on the planet and playing pretty damn well for a 17 year old. And those things you have to factor in because right now, even though they are the same size and basically the same build, I am less concerned about Lucas Raymond's size. He's already transitioned to a yeah, game. Exactly. He's already done it. Whereas Rossi, we don't know. I would bet it will, but we don't. No. Um, I think <clears throat> uh, I was actually talking to Max Boltman about this when we were talking about Scott's rankings and uh, a question came up, which is the, what's the, what's the best defensive center or two way center that, you know, that's under that's small. And I really couldn't think of one, a really good defensive center. That's or like a two way or, center. No, he's not a center. Man. Well, Vincent Trocek is Trocek small. Yeah, I don't. I think he's sub six feet. Uh, that would be surprising to me. I always envisioned him as like six foot. Oh, he's five ten. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, see, this is a Brad question. Thanks, Brad. Uh, that's the kind of stuff you know. Uh, Braden Point. 
Uh, well, is Braden Point a good defensive player? I would yes. argue yes. Yes. Yeah, that's dumb. Okay, how so did, there's two. How did I not get Braden Point? All right, I'm going to move on to Everett Johnson. Um, one of the Leafs' primary penalty killers, Mitch Marner. Yeah. <laughs> Stupid. If only he had any defense on that team to actually help him. Stupid. I'm stupid. Uh, Everett Johnson, uh, sponsor of the show uh, through our giveaways. Always love hearing from Everett. It says, according to Friedman's 31 Thoughts blog, Alexi Marchenko's agent let teams know that he wants to return to the NHL and is seeking something. In no, the- don't say it. No. And is seeking something in the neighborhood of one and a half million dollars a no. season. No. Uh, looks over Detroit's defensive death. No. Considering Daly is definitely not back and Green is also likely gone. Uh, hey, Alexi, remember us? Stevie Y, maybe. No. Jokes aside, if he still proves to be a serviceable defensive defenseman, could he be a good stopgap roster player until a prospect is ready? This would, of course, depend on the term. I could also see a scenario where he could start in Detroit, plays well enough, he could be a trade piece for a contending team. Thoughts? No. <laughs> If you think the Red Wings are boring now, just why would we insert another boring chip off the glass defenseman? Do you know what's going to help Detroit right now? Bad Patrick Nemeth. No, uh, thanks. <laughs> I would probably rather have Lindstrom up next year because I think he's been pretty decent and he seems like a player who is, uh, could do well by the opportunity. And it looks like Everett just mentioned that next to Kaiser, Hronik, Nemeth, Sider, Cholosky, Bowie, slash Marchenko, slash Lindstrom. I mean, Detroit's not thin down the right side here between all. Like, no. Yeah. If you wanted to pay to have a left handed schlub come in and eat some minutes, I could see some value to that next year. But on hey, the right side, that's there's me. Second. Congrats, buddy. You're in. There we go. I'll take league minimum. <clears throat> Uh, Chris says, hey, guys, I was looking at some next-gen stats on hockey, uh, Viz, and had a couple of questions for you. The heat map creates a better all-around idea of how impactful a player is and where as well. How long until we see something like this appear on NBC or other national stages? It seems like everyone only cares about shot charts and numbers. Um, I love the concept of heat maps. Okay, And do not get me wrong. I love everything hockey Viz does. And here's the thing, though. I don't want to see this stuff on NBC because... There are some absolutely great analysts out there and some very bright hockey minds on a lot of these uh, national broadcasts. Uh, I would bet 80% of the people would have, who would have to read them will not be able to understand them and would explain them very poorly. Uh, I think that's fine because I think they're not explaining. I think there's some pretty bad analysts who aren't doing well with what they have right now. So you might that, as well put some good information out there. But is good information good if nobody, if it's not being conveyed properly to the point where nobody understands it? Yeah. And does the average hockey person even really care? You know what? I think uh, good information will beget good information will beget good analysts. So maybe once they this stuff becomes a little bit more popular, like you're seeing game flow and things like that become a little bit more common. Like it's in the NHL app now. I want to see it out there, and I don't think we're too far away. And then once there's more of a want and people respond well to it, I think they'll bring on more knowledgeable analysts and not can Mike Milbury. <laughs> it's, it's a fine line to walk, though, because – now, this is me coming from both aspects of how I watch hockey as a, what do I call myself on the podcast? Like an analyst analyzing the game as I'm watching it. Just call then, yourself Brad. Brad. But then as a fan also watching it, when I'm watching anything just as a fan, I I just want to watch it. I don't particularly care about stats. I don't care about analyst. I don't, I just want to enjoy the entertainment of it. Whereas when I'm watching From this perspective, I want all the information. So I can see how too much information on a broadcast would irritate your casual fan. And I can see how not enough information would irritate your your diehards like us. So it's a really fine line to walk for these uh, telecom companies, if I'm being honest. (laughs) Yeah, you know what? I Someone who has a background in stats and math... I just watch, I watch hockey to be entertained. And if I want to seek out additional information, I will do so. It, it so I, like- I can understand why a casual fan, if that information gets thrown at them with no background on it at all and don't really care, they just want to see Jamie Ben hit uh, Ekman Larson from behind. I can understand them being like, what the hell is this? I have no interest in this at all. Uh uh, to, to the point, the number one, because again, obviously we all watch multiple sports, but like beyond hockey, I probably watch football the most. And a lot of my friends don't watch football and I ask them why. And they're like, I don't get it. They don't get it. They You've got get- 17 minutes between plays to figure it out. <laughs> I know. I'm Don't get me wrong. I'm not justifying it. But they're like, I don't understand why this guy can't do that and why this and when the clock. They're like, it's confusing to me. So I just don't. 
So I could see I'd be worried about the same thing happening if they are throwing up like, and here's this player's expected goals for, but he's only actually got six, but he's generally. But if I, we look I, at the heat map real quick, it's like the weather forecast. They like walk across. This, this, like if you look in the south region here, yeah. got some low pressure. That means he's doing a bad job. That means your that means your left winger sucks. Yeah. But, so I can very much see myself falling onto both sides of this argument. You know what? A good thing for them to do would be like, if you want more in-depth analysis, and then the thing comes up and they put a link and the diehards will go to it, the casuals might, you know, glance at it or not care, but at least they put it out there. God, I'm still waiting for the day where you get like a second channel where it's just like raw game feed with announcers and then like all the player tracking garbage you want on the other one because I would jump back and forth so often. I'm going to move us along. Uh, he goes on to say, why are people still using plus minus? I've heard a lot of people bash it and just as many people use it as a key point for how someone's playing. Is it just an easy way for, to measure what they think is impact or used because it's super easy to understand? The answer is both of those. Plus minus is a good team <clears throat> stat and that's about it for me. Finally, if you can grab one depth score strictly on how good their heat map is, excluding most first line players, who would you take? Uh, the funny answer to this is Glenn Denning or Helm. Darren Helm, because all the chances you want with none of the finish. Final question. What are the odds Stevie makes zero trades at the deadline? Uh, I'd be shocked <laughs> if he made zero. I'd give it a 20% chance. Yeah, it seems pretty low given the position we're in. And we have at least some sort of tradable assets. Yeah. So we of. literally have a defenseman who's requested a trade that he would probably just be willing to give away at this point. Cameron Swick says, just wanted to shout out my local OHL team, the Flint Firebirds. They're tearing up the O right now with the franchise best 13 straight, straight wins. Watch out for Ty Delandria, prospect for the Dallas Stars. That kid is going to be a star, a star in a few years, literally and metaphorically. Uh, <clears throat> can't drink the water, though. Zing. I think, it, yeah, well. No, have they fixed that yet? It's been yeah. like five years. Joseph Delia says, sup, my dudes. I figured out how Detroit's going to win the lottery. Stevie Y needs to hold a press conference saying the following. CT isn't real. Player safety department is never wrong. And Gary Bettman is a cutie patootie. <laughs> it's Thursday and Detroit hasn't made any deals. Do you think he's waiting for teams to get desperate? Or maybe he has no bites. Please spill the beans, guys. Thanks. I know exactly what he's doing. He's waiting for us to finish recording this episode so that we don't talk about it. So what time is it now? Like 6 o'clock? His clock starts yeah. when ours ends. Yeah, yeah, there's a trade coming at like 7.30, 8 o'clock tonight. I'll bet money on it. Uh, Garrett TV says, Hockey Amigos, in case you haven't already, can you share your thoughts on the Jamie Ben hit and lack of supplementary discipline? I feel it's a good contribution of your prior episode comments related to Evander Kane's tweets. If you already did talk about this, then can you please instead uh, post some wildly arbitrary and salacious fake trade rumors? Asking for a friend to get dirty in the corners, boys. Let's go Red Wings. Okay, normally I'm all on the side of punishing the players, but this one it was different because the, LeBron tweeted out the NHL's reason for it, which is they felt it was a puck race that just ended with a dirty play. It wasn't a targeted hit. Which I, for once, actually agree it's with. One of those instances where the one player is a hundred percent dedicated to the puck, and the other guy is a hundred percent going for the body, and you can see in both of their eyes mm -hmm. that. And but they arrived at the same time. I think the way Jamie Ben finished the play was absolutely worthy of being tossed out of the game. But I don't think he went into that instance planning on taking a cheap shot at Ekman Larson. I think he did. Uh, if you look at it. it I think like, there was. Um, I think I he know, went in. Going for a hit, like Evan said. I think was, he was looking for it, but... Was it this year or last year, there was a gif going around of uh, Ekman Larson just absolutely putting shoulder to, to cranium on Jamie Benn? Yeah, they have a history. Do they? Yeah. Oh, that changes things. And, and, that and people don't forget those things. If I they, did. If Jamie Benn thinks it's a cheap shot... Yeah, well, the CTE... Well, you <laughs> forget if you get it. <laughs> um, and Jamie Ben strikes me as sort of the vindictive type, so um, I'm not that surprised that it happened. <laughs> yeah, because like the the play itself, like it wasn't like Larson got to the puck a few steps before Ben. They got there. It was on, ju uh, yeah, just about at the same damn time, which is why I, I'm erring on the side of the benefit of the doubt here. Um, I looked at yeah. it like twenty times. And I honestly couldn't feel one way or the other on this one. If I'm the Department of Player Safety and you take flack all the time, I would have made a political suspension and at least given him a game. 
and made up at least some bogus about how it was a player in a vulnerable position and you can't do that. But on the other hand, it, yeah, like you said, Brad, it, it looked just like two guys came to the puck at the same time. One guy was all puck. One guy was all body. And that was the outcome. Um, we actually have Red Wings news breaking as we're recording. What? Uh, Brian Lashoff recalled oh, under pissing. emergency conditions. <laughs> so annoying. Philip Ronick placed on injured reserve retroactive to February 16th. Yeah, he's out at least the next two games. after. Great. After you know what game. game I'm at? Two games from now. Yeah, well, awesome. I don't get to see a single competent defenseman. I'm so happy. Mike Green, the best defenseman on this team. Let's go. Josh Terrell says, Dub Dub, what type of asset would you be willing to part with to acquire? Gritty as our mascot. Perhaps All. his value is low post scandal. Thank you. I think it starts at Larkin Plus. My hot take is that they don't trade for him because the cost is too high. Instead, they make their own deadline acquisition, someone from within their own organization. Make Ali Octopus a mascot already. And give him the big gut like Gritty has oh, so you yeah. can bump it around. I yeah, love yeah. That. It makes me laugh every time. Eight tentacles that stretch further than the aisles up and down the arena uh, would allow for so he knocks people in the head. I was going to say, he, an octopus walking through the aisles literally would not be able to not hit everybody he walks perfect past. knock over popcorn knock over drinks i want a couple of many children you can punch eight times as many children yeah okay here's the thing though and again playing devil's advocate here if i'm a pretty calm guy by nature i'm non-confrontational but if some jacked up purple net mascot knocks over my 13 dollar bill 13 dollar beer i'm throwing hands <laughs> okay yeah, well, well beers ain't cheap yeah <laughs> Uh, Stay Fresh Cheese Bags of Fournier Company says, but a bum bum ba dum, bum bum ba dum, fwerp. I don't think this is ever supposed to be a tune. Ladies and gentlemen, it's time to take a quick break on prospects and cover the Oscars. Here's my rundown. Dub dub fellows, please feel free to contribute your thoughts after each one. Parasite, stunning, excellent storytelling. Oh man, that was a thrilling movie. I have children, I don't get time to watch movies. Which movie? Parasite. Man, I've wanted to see that so bad. Did watch. Uh, 1917 should have won Best Picture, but I'm okay with how things turned out. Beautiful cinematography. Uh, Joker, smart, albeit smart, albeit problematic movie, but uh, Joaquin, holy hell. Marriage Story, devastating, not a date night movie. Scarlet should have won Best Actress. Adam Driver would have won it if not for Joaquin. Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, incoherent piece of shit that tries too hard, but good for Brad Pitt. Irishman, one of the worst movies I've ever seen. Poop. <laughs> Two popes, more like two poops. <laughs> but who's counting? Good on Jonathan Price. Uh, Little Women could have been so much better, but uh, Seorzi Ronin is excellent. Uncut Gems, Adam Sandler should have been nominated. Hold on. We're at point to what you just tried to pronounce there. Read it. Okay. Uh, Harriet, <laughs> Cynthia, Erivo has arrived. Lots of unrecognized films like Peanut Butter, Falcon, Waves, Us, Queen, and Slim, The Farewell. Hottest of Hot Takes, Robert Downey Jr. should have been nominated nominated for Endgame, Fight Me. Still pissed that the Russian Five documentary wasn't uh, nominated for anything. Hey, Dub Dubs, anyone else in the New York City area? I'm thinking about renting a zip car tomorrow and driving out to Nassau to see the Red Wings versus the Islanders. Shoot me a Twitter DM to Stay Fresh Cheese Bags at Stay underscore Bags. Again, if you want to go see the uh, Islanders play the Red Wings in Nassau, DM at stay underscore bags, stay fresh cheese bags. All right. Trade deadline preview episode wrapped up. Let's get this sorted so Steve Eisman can start trading. Let's thank all of our name level sponsors. Number one, Terry, uh, Dead Panda Society, Brad Smith, Andrew Bohan, Scott Martin, Kayla Thompson, Mitchell Shinkowski, Aaron Taylor, Jacob Turner, Matthew McKay, Matthew M. Rice, Luke Johnson, Mike Reed, Ryan Lewis, Langabeer, Clayton Van Dyken, Kaylin Wood, Hassam al Qasem, Arjun Shanker, Charlie Elkins, Hannah Lee, Sean Levine, Connor Layton, and Danny Jr., Matthew Keeler, Craig Kibble, Rob Thiel, Simon Anderson, John Evans, Kay Waz, and Stan Olson. Thank you all so much. Uh, check your Twitter feeds on Monday. Follow us at Winged Wheel Pod and then follow us three, the hosts. And we will be back to recap everything that happened, like the dramatic Athens to see you trade. Sorry, Brad. On Monday. Night. Let me just refresh to see if it's happened yet. No. Thanks for tuning in to the Winged Wheel Podcast. Be sure to check out wingedwheelpodcast.com, where you can subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. You'll also find links to other ways to support the show, such as Patreon, official podcast apparel, and more. And don't forget to follow the show on Twitter at Winged Wheel Pod. And of course, the hosts at Brad Crisco, at Ryan Hanna WWP, and at Hockey Town Evan.